Hello, and welcome back to Management 101. I am your host, Max Weniger, and I have with me a very special guest today. Oh, I guess for the second time. So you're more like a long-term resident. Is that right? I, I'm backed by popular demand. I got it. <laughs> Fair enough. His name is Spencer Furtick. He is the CEO of Bar None Games and a former colleague of mine from our early Uber days and current friend. Yes. Does that accurately sum up our relationship? It it does. And you're manager slash co-manager for a brief month. Or right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Not just colleague, but you also managed me. I was incorrigible, as they say. Or I think your concern was that I, I took a lot of Fridays off from from not in the office, if I remember. I have since embraced more of a work-life balance mentality, <laughs> but there was a period of time where you spent every Friday in a tier three or four U.S. city that was confusing to some. So a couple pieces of context here. One, the second part is very true. I love mid-sized cities. Spencer, who will be attending my bachelor party, knows that it will be in Louisville, Kentucky, which is, of course, not the most convenient option for someone like me based in San Diego. But I just love mid-sized city America. And uh, the second piece of context is that despite being in the uh, Louisville equivalence of the country, I was very much working. I was simply not in the office on those Fridays. So right, yeah, definitely. if you hire me... If you hire me as your COO, you don't need to worry about me being out every, one out of every five days a week. <laughs> True. Yes, Max was very much working, just also very <laughs> not physically present. You were before yes, your I, time preparing for pandemic era. That's right. I, I knew 2020 was coming, and I, I saw the trend well ahead of my time. And uh, yeah, if anything, that just makes me seem even smarter. Exactly. Well, enough with the small talk, as they said. Let's get, let's get into the questions. Today's topic is going to be about, last week I talked about firing employees. Today we're going to talk about more or less the opposite. Not exactly hiring employees, but rather how to get employees to be their top performing selves. Obviously, in the case that you're firing someone, they're likely not a top performer or they've committed some egregious error of ethical violate. I'm not using those words right. They've they've committed egregious. What what a word am I looking for? Egregious acts. Truly no good. Egre egregious acts. <laughs> and or are bad performers. Today we're going to talk about hopefully the rest of your company, which we're going to make into into top performers. I've asked Spencer to join because despite my being absent from the office or working remotely one out of every five days a week when he was my manager, I consider him to be one of the best managers that I know and have worked for and wish we could make every manager a little bit more like him. So I figured he would- blushing. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. For those of you listening via audio, he he does seem to be <laughs> blushing. And I think the world would be a little better off if, if every manager were a bit more like Spencer. So hopefully we're going to impart some wisdom to the world in that regard. I'm now full. What's the more intense version of a blush? I'm full on red. You're full on red. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Not, well, that, that's very kind. You're not half <laughs> bad either. Thank you. You've never been managed by me, but I guess you've heard tell. Exactly. The stories, the stories out there have been positive. <laughs> cool. Okay. Top performers. Uh, today, we're going to go through a series of questions, which hopefully will just spark some conversation about how to make people really good at their jobs. I also want to shout out ChatGPT for turning these in into funny versions of themselves. And what I'll do is when we get to a time for a question, I will read the regular question and then I will look at ChatGPT's funny version so we can keep this nice and light. Love it. I think, yeah, some are funnier than others. I wouldn't, yeah, so I want to describe them as funny. Whimsical. <laughs> I haven't seen them, so. I, I guess I would describe them as the regular question and then a kind of bizarre add-on question right afterward. Yeah. Cool. So here's the first question, and then I'll read the funny version. What are some of the key qualities of a top-performing employee? And now let me read the chat GPT version. What are the some of the key what are some of the key qualities of a top performing employee and more importantly how do you train an RB of miniature horses to embody those qualities? Ooh. Yeah, I so I think we both didn't want to focus on the second obviously. I was going to say I now am getting a sense of why you invited me on from my horse training training back in 
back in Heights. Yeah, I mean, I, I just imagine most of New Jersey being sort of an equestrian mecca, as it were. Wayne Hills High School, public high school, had a thriving a, equestrian. A thoroughbred. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. that tracks with everything I know about New Jersey. Yeah, cool. Let me put this more succinctly. How would you describe the perfect employee in three words? I'm doing this off the cuff, but it, it is that's good. good. In, oh, that's okay. Cool. Yeah, you're getting the. Yeah, that's the actually thought. better that way. We're getting the unfiltered Spencer Ferdy. Exactly. For me, and I'm curious about your three words, Max. Mine would be reliable. And I don't know what the word for this is, so I'm going to make one up. But next level ship. The ability to take a task and push it farther or see things beyond what they were given. Would you call that proactivity of sorts? That's the word. Yeah, this is where I need to marry. Proact yeah, proactiveness. There's some level yeah. of ownership, I think, in that too. Sure. But yeah, proactive. Yeah, I think what you're saying, this, so the proactiveness part is, part is I'm going to do the additional thing, but you're also saying, I know what the additional thing is to do. Totally. Or I'm going to things that might enhance the goal of this project further. For me, reliability level one is just when a report is tasked with something that you know and trust that that thing will get done on time to a high caliber. And that if it isn't on track, that the person will let you know, and give you updates on kind of timing. And then this next level shift or proactiveness is when carrying out this task or project, this person has an eye towards what's the metric we're trying to move and is there something that I've discovered that my manager maybe doesn't know about that I think can move this further that I'm going to surface and potentially run with. Yeah, I like that. I, I think, what was I, I was going to say something interesting as a follow-up. Right. I'm, sure, I'm sure it was great. The world will never know. But one thing I would add to all of this is, and I, I always interview for this, openness to feedback and desire to learn. I think those those sound like two different things, but they're actually very much the same. Yeah, absolutely. That doesn't that doesn't mean someone who's gunning for growth, right? Someone can not be seeking to be the rock versus the rock star, but they still need to be open to learning and open to being wrong and more importantly, desiring to change and adapt. Yeah. And I think Part of it is sometimes on the manager too, but hiring people who aren't defensive or who are able to separate back on a project from feedback on themselves as a person, I think is is really important. And there's also a task on you as the manager to deliver that feedback in a way that doesn't feel attacking and will be received best by your employees. Absolutely. Yes, that that's fair. You as a manager can definitely do a lot of damage to someone who's generally open to feedback by delivering it in the incorrect way. Okay. Yeah, that is that is fair. Cool. Okay. We've got some top, some top traits of employees. And now we're going to talk about how we train armies of miniature horses to embody those qualities. How, how do we actually make people exhibit or develop those qualities? Why don't we start with your, your first one, which is positivity. Yeah. And positivity there was like a a catch-all, I think, just for general attitude one brings to the workplace. And that isn't sure. confused with rah, rah, I live and breathe my work and this is the most important thing to me, but more just who I show up as, as a team player, as someone who's, yeah, excited to contribute and just generally brings good energy. Positivity, I think, is more something that I screen for than something that I can innately train. In interviews, looking for someone whose energy and demeanor matches that tone that we're looking for. But as a manager, I think me bringing that positive energy to our team all hands and leading by example is the best way that I found I can encourage others to let their genuine energy shine through. Totally. Yeah. I think the number one thing to do is lead by example and as much you can give all the feedback in the world, but if you're not embodying that characteristic or trait yourself, why would anyone else be incentivized to do so? I, I think that's totally fair. Screening for it, of course. I mean, there are some people who, for whatever reason in their current point in their careers and lives are really not capable of being particularly positive or having a good attitude, and that's okay. They may not be the right fit for our companies at this particular time. Of course, screening for it is really important. But as you said, also setting the example as the leader of this is the this is the way I want people to show up. The company is really important too. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. No, and you bring up a great point, Max. I, I've been 
I don't know that positive is the right word. Maybe the word is genuine because you're right. People are going to, I have this where there's hardships going on outside of work or in my personal life that make it hard for me to be happy on every single team call. And I think just maybe having an openness, not to go through the details of every single problem you're having, but to feel, create a level where an environment where people feel comfortable saying, Hey, I'm not, I'm having a rough goal of it outside of work right now. So I can't be my normal cheerful self, but totally. here's what's going on. And uh, I'll, I'll be my normal self at X point in the future or not normal self, but my regular typical self. -er. Yes, I agree. Just being real is different than being 100% positive and probably being real is preferred. I, I also think that when people are having a hard time, having having a good attitude about it is not has nothing to do with the hard time you're having, but rather it is how you're reacting to other people related to it, right? I, I'm not going to tell you to not have a hard time with whatever's going on in your personal life. That's very much not my place as your manager, nor as a fellow human being, but... I think there's a difference between I'm having a hard time in my personal life and therefore I'm going to take it out on people at work versus yes. I'm having a hard time in my personal life. However, I'm still going to show up. And even if I'm not my best self, I'm not going to let that affect other people. For sure. And, and I will say, and I know we probably have a lot to get to, so I don't want to no, uh, this is a good start. too much further down this hole, but I, a tactical thing that I do, I see a therapist every week and I Same have... Here a hold on my calendar. I have a public calendar that all employees can see that says therapy on that for that hour. And not that every person who has something going wrong in their life needs to see a therapist, but it can be helpful for a lot of people and normalizing that in the company that I'm not around from 9 to 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning because I'm in therapy. 10 to 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. Do we have the same therapist? Well, mine's specific, so it's actually 1 to 2 your time. That's all. Well, now everyone, uh, yeah. Also, I don't think legally we can have the same therapist due to a state li licensures. And that's a whole other podcast. But uh, <laughs> but but that that's been that's been a really important thing for me. And it's but their their therapy appointments again, not mandating that people be public about it, but creating a culture where people feel comfortable finding time and space for self care has been really important. I completely agree with that. Therapy has also historically been a public appointment on my calendar. Let me tell you the appointment I make private though. Lunch. Oftentimes, companies do not, people, other employees don't respect lunch. They're like, oh, I can write over that because that can be mood. Well, no, that's actually my recharge time, and I own my calendar, not not you. Fascinating. Yeah. So therapy, public, lunch, private. Yeah. I know, paradoxical to all the baby boomers out there. Okay, now, let, let me give you a, let me throw an ex example or situation your way. Actually, before we get to that, I have a hot take. I'm curious your thoughts on it. I'm excited. You mentioned earlier, you don't need someone who lives and breathes their work. I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't think that's necessarily, I don't think living and breathing your work makes me think you're a better candidate for a job or better at your job. It actually, I think is a red flag. What are your thoughts? That to me is not a hot take at all. Or if it is a hot take, then we're both contrarians. <laughs> I, I fully agree. I had this really formative experience early on where I was applying to be the CFO of this student-run company in my college, which anyone listening who knew I talk about ad nauseum, the Corp. Yeah. The Corp. Sorry. I think the Coop's Harvard. Yeah. I Yeah. That, that didn't get in there for undergrad. But at Georgetown, I, I, worked, at, I worked at the Corp and I just loved being part of the student-run grocery store and coffee shop. Point being, I interviewed against 10 other people to be the CFO of the company and got the role and was told that the reason that I got the role is because while I seemed passionate about it, it also didn't seem like it was my end all be all and that I could live a very rewarding life had I not gotten that role. And I similarly wow. agree, Max, that I use that as a tool too. Who are people who are passionate about the mission, who are excited to come to work, but who also have a life outside of outside of work such that we aren't the end all be all is something that I think is a, is a really important screening question for the type of employee who's going to be a good fit under me as a manager. Yeah, I, I love that. And what a great parable for your life. Yeah, it's a lesson you learned early. Lucky me. Yeah, indeed. Why is uh, it why why is it why is it a red flag for you? I think so I I remember this very vividly at Uber. You actually might know this person. Of course, I will not mention them by name, but teammate who worked with who I worked with for a little bit of time and they were one of those employees who who decided that they could not take vacation because I'm actually not 100% clear the reason 
However, it came across as basically, I have to do every single thing possible to deliver this work and I can't take vacation. I'm going to work all night, every night, really grinded themselves to the bone. Well, one, I think past a certain point in your week, in terms of how we're invested, you're simply not that productive an employee anymore. I've read some study once that was after hour 45 or something, your productivity per hour plummets. This person was getting into their 55th, 60th hour of, t of time. And technically they were doing work, but I'm not really sure what the value add was at that point. And it also made this person really unenjoyable to work with because they were just upset and unhappy all the time because not everyone else was committed the same to the same level they were. And I think also they were probably just really tired. There was no advantage to this person working so hard and making this their entire life. Someone who worked fewer hours could have been just as productive in terms of output and a lot more of a collaborative and enjoyable presence when working yeah. with others. Yeah. I have multiple guesses, which makes it which is concerning. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> His name was Max Winokur. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even on Fridays in Louisville, Kentucky, he was working himself to the bone. I don't know why I just created a trailer I, for this movie of yeah. Hoover Career. Anyway. I'll have a I'll have a title for this movie by the end of the podcast. This sounds good. You can type it in chat yeah. GPT. Okay. This is not a chat GPT question, by the way. This is a follow-up question to some things you just said. Let's take one of these traits. Proactiveness. Yeah. So you've got an employee now who's not demonstrating that. Uh, yeah. both they're not sure what they're supposed to do next. They're like really looking for guidance from you. And even when given that guidance, they don't really take action. You really have to, you have to hold them accountable in a way that you don't feel is a great use of your time as a manager. How do you, what do you do to take that person from where they're at today, not taking proactive action and not knowing what action to take to that ideal state that you talked about? Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's kind of two separate issues that I heard there. The first one I think is easier which is why I'll say the answer first, which is what do you do with someone who you say be more proactive and they don't know how to, when you have this, when you have a quality that you want someone to exhibit that can feel a little nebulous or hard to quantify, like what is proactiveness? And so for me, the easiest thing is going through discrete examples of their three most recent projects where they had maybe given what you were looking for, but not much more, or a metric that hadn't moved the amount that you both thought it would. And literally... Tell them what you would have done had you been in their shoes to give them tactical tips on a retrospective basis. And then what I would do is apply that to the next task at hand for them. Okay, given these three things that we would have done on each of these last projects, what is the first thing that comes to your mind to do that would maybe take this next project a step above? Or what's even a question that you want to ask to dig a little further into the thing that you've been given? Those are the things that I would use to help with bucket one, how do I actually really define what proactiveness is? And I think in this case, it's asking a question that goes a level beyond or adding something to a project that enhances the metric you're trying to move. I like that. And one thing I want to call out here yes. that you at least said you've done effectively in this example is you're not telling the person what to do. You're explaining to them the situation, right? In a, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a very non-accusatory way, just like this was the outcome and here is the more ideal outcome. And then you are working with them to help them figure out how to achieve that more ideal outcome the next time, rather than just telling them what to do. Exactly, Max. And the other thing is if you need to even go a layer further, say that's still not working, I think the other thing you can do is as you identify the retrospective thing you could have done in each of those last three projects to where your report could have been a bit more proactive, ask them a few questions like what's the underlying thread in each of these things? You know, it's three different projects and three different tasks. What's the underlying thread? What's the underlying question that we're asking in each of these cases to move the needle a little bit further? And then from that frame, enable the person to apply that same question to the next project at hand. So you're, you know, really pr putting a tactical framework around this nebulous quality that you are trying to grow. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Generally frameworks in, in terms of, it's one thing to provide a specific tactical example and say, this should have happened differently, right? It's it's one level better to say, here were a bunch of examples and here was the pattern, right? Because then maybe they might recognize that pattern in the future. It's a the highest order to say, 
here is the way to think about this in the future and give them the framework, right? People's brains like having lenses through which to view things instead of assuming that they know what you're talking about and could easily identify that same problem in the future. You're saying, just apply this mental model to then do it yourself in the future. Exactly. And especially because with a quality like proactiveness, what you're in the situation you're describing, the most frequent thing is I don't even know how to deliver what you're asking me. Being able to marry, okay, here's what it is that I'm asking you tactically with, but balls also in your court to kind of put your own twist on this, I think is the most positive way to bring that person to action. Love that. One thing I will, one thing I'll call out is depending on someone's level of development, literally just experience in their career or experience in this type of role, you probably will get quite a range of actual proactiveness. I think about development along the line of starting with very much handholding the what and the how. Here's what needs to happen and I need to show you how to do it, right? It's like a baby. They come out, they come out into the world and they don't know a whole lot. You have to show them the what and the how. But as they as they develop, they'll start to know the how more and more, right? Once they've done yeah. the process a few times, then they'll know the how more effectively because it just it's rinse and repeat. They still may not know always the what, right? They may not know exactly what to do in all situations, but if you ask them to do something, they'll know how to do it. The final metamorphosis of you will, if you will, going from chrysalis to butterfly. Was that right? I think that's right. I, I got a, the grade I won't disclose here in biology, so I can't help you ignore it. The same here. Survived anyway. The, the butterfly version is I both know what I need to do without your involvement as a manager and how to do it. I think what I'll call out is someone may not be proactive in terms of I know exactly what to do next and I'm going to do it. But I think the substitute for that earlier in someone's development is I'm really hungry to figure out what to do next. And I'm going to ask you, even if I don't know myself. For sure. And I think there's a big difference and you can still coach on this, just someone who's not proactive and knows what to do. You can still coach on this and say, there are a number of examples here where even if you didn't know exactly what to do next, I it would have been ideal for you to at least call out, I'd like to take this further. Absolutely. I, I think that's spot on. And I also think to your point about levels of development, proactiveness, I think matters to me across the spectrum, but particularly when I'm managing a, a manager level for either someone who's managing managers or a manager level employee or above someone whose job is to project manage and project ideate. I think when I'm managing as I do now, well, analysts or associates, people earlier in their careers, I like to inspire proactiveness to try to get that skill started early, but reliability, which I know is the third I mentioned, matters to me far more. And it's probably the single most important quality to me in a report that when you are given a task that you will either speak up if you don't agree with the task or have questions about it. But once you kind of sign off on I'm bought in and I'm going to carry this out by a certain time that I can trust you to finish it on time and to a high degree. And that if something is going wrong, that you will flag to me before the due date, what's going on, what's going wrong so I can help you troubleshoot. That to me is just the one thing that is true table stakes in, in anyone who's working. For Could not agree more. I think probably that's also true in life. Partners, yeah. friends, you name it. Reliability is really important because I think we, our brains tend to tend to make connections between if this happens, then I can expect this outcome. And people being reliable means you can draw those conclusions and have a level of comfort. And when that doesn't happen, it's very hard to manage, both in a people management setting, but also in an emotional setting. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Everyone should be more reliable. Please, if you're hearing it, listening at home, be more reliable. We admonish you to do that. Okay. I think I know the answer to this question. Actually, I definitely know the answer to this question, but I, I don't know if all of our listeners do, so I'm going to ask it anyway. I guess it's less relevant if I know the answer to this question. Otherwise, I'd just have a podcast in my own brain. When it comes to employee motivation, actually, first, I'm going to ask the normal question, and then I ask the, the chat GPT version. Yeah. It'll be in two takes again. When it comes to employee motivation, are you more of a carrot or a stick person? And now the chat GPT version. Actually, this is maybe a little concerning. When it comes to employee motivation, are you more of a carrot or a stick person? And have you ever tried motivating your team with an actual carrot or stick? And how did that go? Ah, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> this goes back to the band of horses situation. I think probably motivated with carrots is a great idea. Yes, in this virtual team building environment in which we live in, check out barnardgames.com, which we don't offer what I'm about to suggest, but yes, salad, salad making would be what I used to carrot to. No, we never sure. do virtual salad making. Yeah, Max, yeah, it, for me, the answer is stick. And the reason is, no, I just wanted to see Max's face. No, it's carrot. And, uh, and I mean, there's the obvious, no, not obvious reasons, but the reasons that are obvious to me, which is just for me. And I think this is the CEO of a business. There is just work has a place in my life and it is a substantial place, but it is, it, it is maybe 30 to 40% of my pie or at some weeks, 50%, but it's not the majority of the pie of what brings me joy and not the majority of what I want to bring my colleagues joy either. And for me, creating an environment where people are, I know the feeling of having had Sunday scaries that is so not the environment that I want to create for colleagues. And, and the other thing that I would say is, okay, that maybe that answer sounds a little Mother Teresa-ish. Oh, that's so nice that you just want everyone to be happy at work. But also selfishly, I don't like the person that I am if I have to be creating an environment where there's sticks. And me, that is admonishing people, chastising people. That's not who I want to be. So I screen heavily for people who would be motivated by carrots, not sticks. And I would rather a kind of performance exit someone out of the company who can't thrive in that carrot world than live in a world where I'm routinely admonishing people for work to get done. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Let me add a layer to this, which is I unfortunately believe that it is possible for the stick method to work. I've had, I've worked for leaders who very much use the stick method ruled by fear and it has worked. Dictatorships are literally a culture of fear. I don't know. I define them as they work in the sense that they exist, right? And they continue right. to exist. I I have come to believe, though, that the stick method and ruling by fear is very much a short-term solution. And it causes all sorts of long-term problems that motivation with carrot does not. So I think... If if the world were ending tomorrow and all the business had to be completed in one day today and there were literally no consequences, I don't know that I could argue that the carrot approach is significantly better than the stick approach. But the fact that we have to repeat this scenario for the rest of our lives means, in my mind, that the carrot approach wins every single time. And the stick approach is really for managers who I... I this might be a little bit of a hot take, who might lack confidence in their ability to be a good leader. Again, the coldest take I've heard this time <laughs> Mississippi. I think it is the people who use the stick, I find often are doing it to have the yelling mask, a lack of vision or a lack of confidence. Yeah, That's been my experience with managers who, who, who use the stick on me. So I, I fully agree with that. I think my only question back to you, Max, and you kind of answered this, we're like, now I'm the podcast host. Is, oh, wow. Uh, what a turn of events. Is, yeah, what does worked mean? And I think you said something like, oh, the fact that it exists means that it worked because does the stick, can the stick method lead to, you said, short-term impacts positively on the bottom line? Sure. And on a larger company level, okay, shareholder value? Sure. But on the broader sense of just what's the kind of leader that you want to be? What's the kind of value that you want to take from your time at work there is so much collateral damage beyond the short-term financial impact of the stick method that to me it just it, yeah it just renders it kind of unusable and i will say that and i said this in my last podcast i feel like if i did this is embarrassing because i don't talk about this a lot but i just think about how when barack obama and i, I might be repeating myself how when barack obama left the presidency what many people would say was an impactful presidency me being one of them the fact that no person under him published some tell-all saying what a jerk this guy was i thought was amazing because to me it proved that you can be in a, a lot of hush money yeah or that or that but most most other presidents democrat and republican alike you've seen tell-alls after their administrations and to see an example of someone who i viewed as a successful leader doing so not saying he never got tough or demanded things of his reports but generally through positivity and praise and optimism yeah it's really inspiring to me yeah, I completely agree. I, I think also carrot doesn't mean you're just rose-colored glasses, really yeah. soft and nice all the time. I think it's possible to both be serious and caring. Yes. Right. So I don't think, don't take this to mean you as a leader, have, using the carrot approach, you have to create the most cuddly environment imaginable for your employees. I, I think it, 
in order to be a genuine leader, a good leader, you have to be a genuine leader. And some people are better with the really soft stuff than others. But I think you can be not so great with the soft stuff and still cultivate an environment where people do not feel fear. A hundred. I, I think that's a hundred. I think that's spot on, Max. For me, as I've grown as a manager, I have become a little less soft and cuddly. I think I, I came from a finance world where I routinely was yelled at. I then don't think I overcorrected in Uber to the extent that I just wanted people to like me and enjoy work. And I definitely still err to that side more than the other side. But having a culture also where there is accountability and when people are assigned stuff, they feel like they should get that done. And the motivator behind that being that if you get that done, you are praised and appreciated rather than if you don't get that done, you are publicly chastised or admonished to me is the is the is the rub of ruling not ruling but managing with a carrot versus stick approach the uh, two by two matrix of radical candor says you both need to challenge directly on one axis and care on the other axis and yeah. if you challenge directly without caring it is called obnoxious aggression if you care without challenging directly it is called ruinous empathy and ruinous empathy, though I just want everyone to like me, so I'm not going to ever say anything bad about them or push them or call them out if something has gone wrong, is not an ideal setup in the slightest. Yeah. You will not be successful as a ruinously empathetic manager, so don't take the carrot. Please, no one take the carrot to mean you can't speak up and deliver critical feedback in direct ways. Yes. Cool. Okay. Let's, I think we're going to go back to the performance management or performance development conversations a little bit and talking about, okay, we've got an employee who we really want to help. They've demonstrated interest in developing, right? They're ready to be a great performer. They're not there yet for whatever reason. Let's talk through the, the tools that employees need in order to get there. And I don't mean the hammer and the Phillips head screwdriver, though maybe in certain settings, for instance, a carpentry business, that is necessary. I, I, I think I mean more figurative tools. I'll, I'll ask this and then I'll ask the chat GPT version. Oh, wow, is actually spot on to what I just said. Okay, how do you ensure that your employees have the tools they need to succeed? Do you literally hand them a toolbox or is there a more figurative approach that you take? Either I subconsciously already read this question in ChatGPT form, or I am ChatGPT. Am I, I one and one or the other? I yeah, I can, I can give. Am I allowed to throw questions back to you to give your first take, Max, or do I? Oh sure, the first. I think take? That's yeah, allowed. Allowed to, I don't, yeah, I've had like set of guidelines and rules for for how Manager One Hundred One with Max is supposed to go. So I'm going rogue. It's my second time back. First time back. Here, second help. First time back. I'm already yeah. manifesting. And we'll see if we'll see if they let me back after this. But yeah, Max, what would you what would you say to that? Okay, so tools that are needed to succeed. One, documentation. I think this is the big failure of new managers is not appropriately documenting. If we agree on a development plan, if we say Look, here are the things that I think are the difference between you being a good employee and you being a great employee. They are communication with your colleagues. It needs increased clarity and it needs more directness, let's say. And then going back to one thing you said, positivity. 75% of the time you demonstrate a great attitude. When you're having a tough day, though, it is very obvious. And as you grow in your career, you're going to impact more and more people. And that will need to shift in order for you to be an effective leader. You can't have a bad day to other people in the same way you can have a bad day to yourself. If you just say those things and then walk away, you're going to show up six months later and the likelihood that that person has really done a good job of focusing on those and you have revisited them effectively is, is quite low. I think a lot of things will have to very luckily happen. If you document it, you say, today, we're just going to write down, these are the things that we are focused on for your development plan. And then you create a plan to check in on those things. And you take notes and examples and you document what you discussed each of those check-ins, whether every week, every month, every quarter, you're much more likely to achieve success. One Writing things down symbolizes a commitment that just saying them simply doesn't. 
because it's just the way our brains work for some reason. Two, it's a forcing mechanism to talk about it on a regular basis. And three, you can watch change and record change happen over time. That is why performance improvement plans are not verbally delivered and then you walk away. That is why performance improvement plans are literally written down. I, I feel very strongly that writing down development plans is the same way as writing a project plan. It's a lot more likely to be successful if you document effectively. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would act, I, I, I firmly disagree. Oh, wow. Okay. You, you no. don't like writing. Yeah, no, I just wanted to feel what that would feel, what that would say. Feel what that would feel. Feel what that would say. I, I, I don't care. Watch. Yeah, exactly. Your first, your second, your second time fact. I know exactly. Exactly. Crochet that on a pillow. No, I. I mean, I. I'm coming up with this as we speak. But based on, I, I could say to me, there's a car analogy here, which is that I think when you're a manager and you're in the day to day, you're oftentimes in execution mode. There is so much that you need to get done. The idea of taking a step back to document a performance improvement plan to have a regular meeting cadence to get your person get your employee to be a great employee rather than just a good employee can feel like a nice to have but not a need to have and for me it's just what is the metaphor that will drive home the importance of doing just what you said based on my days as an auto mechanic back in new jersey I, and sure. my love of cars but i think subsequently a taxi dispatcher for uber yeah cars have been a it all makes sense now yeah, now I spend my Thursdays just praying and just sitting in my car hoping the alternate side parking people won't catch me. So my love of cars <laughs> runs deep. It's a very New York-specific reference. Oh, yeah, exactly. For, for any listener not in New York, we'll get into that in a different podcast. But the point being, I like to think of it as there's I can either take the time to refuel gas in my existing car. It, I know that it can go further, but it's not going to get there without some gas. In, in gas in this in this example being guidance from the manager if sure. you don't put gas in the car it's probably going to break down on the highway and then you're going to need to pay some maintenance bill because your oil's all messed up or whatever results from your car running out of gas on the highway that's going to cost more and then the worst case scenario is that you need a totally new car because this car is like unusable while in the short term you might get to disney world 10 minutes later because you pulled over for gas mid and long term it's so worth it to invest in Agreed. documentation and meetings for your employees. Yeah. It's like they say about customers, it is much cheaper to retain a customer than to acquire to acquire a new one. And is that what they say? Nice. That makes sense, yeah. Well, according to the business school that Ryan went to in the office and <laughs> Michael Scott asked him about, that was the answer to the question, is it cheaper to acquire a new customer or retain an existing one? Oh, so I can I can only assume that that's accurate. I, that, that checks out. Yes, documentation. I, I think there are some other tools, which is maybe a little bit softer around setting them up in the right environment, right? I like to use the sports analogy here, not because I'm some huge sports fan, though I do deeply love my Boston sports teams. And now the Padres, by the way. My first opening day I went to yesterday was a lot of fun. Whoa. Neither here nor there. I mean, technically it's here, but neither here nor there conversation-wise. If you try to make a catcher play pitcher, they're not going to do a great job. If you try to make a quarterback play defensive line, they're not going to do a good job, right? Both quarterbacks and defensive linemen are good at some things and not others. You need to make sure that you're putting them in a position to succeed. And so I think one of the tools you have as a manager is identifying what are the things that are really great about this employee? What are the things that they struggle with? And I think struggle with in the sense that we've talked through these, we've worked on developing them, and they're really not going anywhere. There are some things that people are just more naturally good at than others. The tool you have as a manager, the tool you need to give them is setting up their work in a way that matches to the things that they're best at, both in terms of the style that they have, as well as the literal skills that they have. Yeah. I can say also, uh, as a listener in that last minute, thank you for giving us the football analogy after the baseball analogy for those who didn't know about pitchers and catchers. <laughs> I think it was the quarterback defensive line thing that really kind of nailed nailed it home. Well, I was going to start with catcher. I was like, you can't make him play left field. But then I was like, actually, a lot of catchers move to left field over the course of their career because their knees give out. So I actually, that, that was a really bad analogy. I should have started with the football one because it made a lot more sense. You can fix that in post, I feel like. That's true. Yeah, I will just yeah. edit edit that out because it's incredibly embarrassing. I, For someone I who benchwarmed Division three baseball, I should know better. 
I think a lot for the three fantasy baseball listeners on this podcast know that uh, Max apologizes. That's right. The other thing on this is just not assuming, right? They're not assuming that you know what's going on with your report. Just asking questions, like a lot of what we've described, putting people in the role that they're most set up for success, documenting a performance improvement plan. Some of that, or a lot of that, relies on your intuition as a manager of where a person will thrive and what the business needs. For me, there has sometimes been a large gap between my assumptions of where a person will thrive and what they actually want to do. Just making sure that you are checking in with your employees. Sometimes their dream role will not match what the business needs and that it's okay. But I have seen good performers become great performers when they are working on work that they are passionate about or developing skills that they are excited to develop. Yep. I think that's fair. You called out the important piece of this conversation, which is don't just assume that you know what they're good at, what they're not good at, yep. and also what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Certainly involving them in that process is a incredibly wise and important step. Okay. I have, I have two more discussion barking, hopefully, questions. If you're still with us, we're going to keep make this part extra spicy. <laughs> well, we'll do up the question there. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, the non-chat GPT version, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made as a manager trying to improve employee performance? And then chat GPT added, did you blame it on the interns? Oh, actually not sure I've worked, other than my first company, Capital One, I'm not sure I've ever worked at a company that had interns, so maybe chat GPT is not as quite as omniscient as I thought. Yeah, I are there horse interns? I worked with interns at Morgan at my first job, and I I did I I took I didn't blame anything on the interns because I was a huge people pleaser. I took that sounds like people. a strategic mistake, according to yes, I, yes question is for empathy. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, I need a second to think. The biggest mistake I've ever made as a manager when trying to improve someone's performance said in a slightly different way: you were trying to help someone get better, and they didn't. Or they got worse. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind that I'm not going to delve into deep because I did on the last podcast, and I know everyone here listened to me on that one, so I wouldn't want to be duplicative. Is YouTube gets 100 new listeners a week. By the way. Oh my God. Okay. Well, then here, for those, for, for the new, new listeners to the pod, I, I almost got passed up on a promotion. A promotion was delayed because I'm in my room. I was promoted into a GM role, which was a stretch role for me at the age of in my mid 20s. And I, and I, seized the day and made the most of it but in the annual feedback for my team i engaged in ruinous empathy and only highlighted the positive attributes of what they were doing and and the constructive areas i really couched in you could do this better but don't worry i noticed that you're doing x y and z so it's kind of fine and the issue there as we've noted is that in not in trying to be sensitive to others feelings i was not directly letting them know where i expected them to improve in order to reach the next level and in doing that was depriving them of the thoughts that were still living in my head about where they were lacking. That's the first example that comes to mind. Yeah, that's a great one. You wanted them to improve. You gave them no guidance as to how to improve because you wanted them to like you and thus they did not improve. When you put it like that, it sounds pretty everything. Yeah, that has that I would call that. And I am now a managed expert. But but yes, I would I would say that (laughs) succinctly is what I did. I I've been told I'm a good summarizer. Yes. I worry at times that it borders on mansplaining, though I do actively try to stay away from that, of course. However, I think hope, hopefully what, what I said summarized and supported what you said. It did not over overshadow what you said. No, I think it was great. I have a post in here that says, speak slowly and succinctly. And I think I have it fell off my computer and now I'm doing neither. So <laughs> thank you for summarizing. But to be fair, if I just said the th- the six words I did, that would have been a useless story. Stories are what help people grasp the concept i think i just put the little bookend on it as I it agree. were yeah as it were which is a phrase i like using now apparently a little bow yes a little bow oh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna tell a fun fun story and then maybe you can summarize for me yes max was an asshole and it didn't work out <laughs> yeah so that's your you're welcome up, that's your upcoming autobiography type <laughs> one, i believe so i don't want to steal that somehow i manage as an asshole i had a direct report same company Different city, a di- not a different market and literally physically different city. Because after I left where Spencer and I worked together in D.C., I had a direct report who was having a really hard time. They're really good at executing on their work, but had a really hard time figuring out what the right work was to do. 
So if I handed this person a project and said, here's the exact outcome we're looking for, they would get it done. The trouble they were having is they were now a manager of a pretty sizable team and they were reporting to me and they not only had to, I mean, they actually weren't even doing that much work themselves at this point. They were managing a team and having that team, of course, that team was doing the work. At that point, I couldn't tell this person, here's what your team needs to do, right? When you become a manager of a team, you have to determine what your team should be focused on. And we, we are going through a road mapping process for one of the quarters, which quarter probably unimportant. And this person brought me the roadmap for their team. I looked at it and I was aware of the things we were trying to achieve as an organization. Of course, more drivers in the right places at the right times and classic driver operation stuff. And I looked at what this person's roadmap looked like and I, and I thought to myself, I don't, I, I can't imagine a world where these are the things that are the best opportunities to achieve the outcomes we want. These just don't seem super well thought through. I had a conversation with this person and it went really well. This person and I had built a lot of trust and, and they agreed that there was probably an opportunity to better match the work that needed to be done with what projects their team was actually doing. Great. That part went really well. Went a quarter before this problem arose again. This person presented a draft roadmap for the next quarter in front of a team that included me and a bunch of other leaders in the organization. And I delivered some pretty similar feedback. I said, are you, sh I said something like, and I'm going to paraphrase myself because I obviously don't remember what I said exactly seven years ago or whatever it was. Are you sure that these are the projects that make the most sense for achieving these goals? We had some small conversation back and forth in this meeting. And then afterward, he came to me and he said, you were such a jerk. You called me out in front of all of these other leaders and made me look like an idiot. And my intention, of course, was not to make him look like an idiot. That served me no good. And my intention was really to help him get better. But instead, what I did was I eroded a trust that had taken a long time to build between us, between us. And the result was that we had a very hard time working together for quite a while. And it required a lot of investment on my part just to get us back to a point where I could even help him be successful. That is my story of how, despite wanting this outcome, I achieved kind of the opposite with how I handled it. What would you do different? If you could go back in time, what would you do differently? I think I swayed too far into obnoxious aggression. While I definitely challenged directly, I don't know that I demonstrated caring personally. As much as I definitely cared about this direct report, I really wanted him to be successful. I genuinely believe that I, as a leader, am only as successful as my team is. In fact, yeah. the only thing that matters to my success, I did not demonstrate that. I, I made him look bad and I wasn't necessarily trying to. I certainly wasn't trying to, but I did it. And I think in the future, the lens I would take, which I always take now, is when something might be perceived or construed as critical feedback, that conversation has to happen in private every single time. There is no world in which calling someone out publicly even if it seems relatively minor to you, is the appropriate course of action. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a little bit, it's kind of related earlier to that stick conversation. I think a man, and I'm not, this I know was a moment for you. This doesn't characterize you as a manager at all, but this people who use stick sometimes using that as a replacement for confidence or original thought or other things. I think sometimes when people call someone out, call a report out publicly, there's probably a little part inside you or the average person that's saying, I don't want to be associated with this thing. But I'm that's very publicly, I disavowed myself from this, which short term can feel good. But I think the, as, as we evolve as leaders, the true leader will be able to kind of sit in that discomfort. And then when not in the group, have that conversation, both downwardly with the report, as well as if there's any upward management you that need to do too, to let leaders know, hey, I'm aligned with the vision something got lost in translation. Like you said, making sure those conversations are happening on an individual basis too. 100%. I think your call it is right. I am very sure that there was some subconscious part of me that was feeling this is this doesn't look good and it's making me look bad and therefore I need to put the burden back on this direct report that this is their doing and not mine. But ultimately that was a real 
even if my subconscious was thinking that, that was of course not the right course of action because it didn't make me look any better. Right. No one was sitting there thinking, oh, is this person and not Max, right? They're right. just, it's my team, regardless yeah. of who's doing it to my team. And also I completely eroded the trust of that individual and stopped the improvement from actually occurring for a while because I had to spend so much time rebuilding that trust. It was worth completely, it was very rash of me and not thoughtful at all. And the subconscious part of me that was like, oh, I don't want to look bad. That was it. That was a very unfair thing to put on that direct report. Yeah. Well, and I think it's the beauty of you and a leader publicly kind of talking about it. And I also think maybe it's a different podcast that how that conversation went. But I also find that I'm sure you were like this being just open and apologetic and upfront. I'm I'm surprised almost by you saying that this one thing caused there to be months of trust that you then had to rebuild on the other side of it, which I guess speaks to the power of some of these things. But but I don't know, as a manager, I've also found that when I am apologetic and own my own mistakes, that that is usually the best thing that I can do when these situations arise, which might totally. be trust. Humility, other than kindness, is probably the number one thing that a leader can demonstrate and set the example for. I could tell you that if you, as a leader, never take responsibility for your mistakes, you're definitely not setting anyone else up to do that. And when you have people who don't take responsibility for their mistakes, they get defensive instead of collaborative. Yeah, They don't focus on solving the problem they focus on who is demonstrating who's responsible for the problem, which is ultimately a pretty useless exercise and yeah. very destructive to both company culture, but more, more strategically, very destructive to solving the problems that need to be solved to be successful as a business. Absolutely. Be the leader you want to leave you. Well said. Well said. Although I, I have read the uh, platinum role of management, which is, don't be the leader you want to lead you, but be the leader you understand others to need. Oh, yeah. I still haven't reached that level yet. That, that, that's that's, that's the level. ultimate level. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough. Okay, we got one more question, but I, I wanted to insert a, a plug for something. It's not a sponsored, it's not sponsored content. Did you see that Taylor has been drawing comparisons of Bruce Springsteen for her Eras tour? I did not. I don't think that's a thing. She's doing something like 44 songs. Oh, that's the thing. That which is good. very Springsteen-esque. Good for her. That's a, Plus dancing. Good. Plus having wild, we priced tickets on Ticketmaster. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. I don't know if that was 100% her fault. Yeah. I don't think it's Bruce's fault either. This is where I, 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 I will gladly take this. I need to. I need to research more, but I'm not... I'm not ready to assign blame to anyone, but I'm not pleased. Is where I for, uh, means the V Tech and Master. That's fair. For those lacking content, Spencer contact Spencer is a is a huge Springsteen fan. Has been to over 25 concerts, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going on or, Monday. I'm going on Monday. Yay! I haven't seen him in seven years. Oh, that's awesome. Where at? Barclay Center, ten minutes down the oh wow down the street. Very that is awesome. Yeah, you are also a Taylor Swift fan. I am. I'm both. I can. I am. I, I am a newly minted Taylor Swift fan. As of meeting my now fiance Rachel, who is a avid Swifty, and Spencer has routinely made fun of me for my likes of very deep rabbit hole Swifty content on Instagram. I am praying that there is some bachelor party roast that I can partake in, where I can <laughs> share some of my favorite screenshots of accounts that Max has like the average. I yeah, the just Taylor Swift that really pumped them. We are doing our first dance to an acoustic version of a Taylor Swift song. Oh, yay! I, I mean, I like that. Yeah, that it's, it's a good one. It's our song. Or, sorry, it's not our song. It is our Taylor Swift song. Oh, I should I should be confused with the Taylor Swift song. with the Taylor Swift song named our song. Yes, oh, that, that is a good one. To be fair, yeah. Well, well I, I've now aggressively digressed, yeah. as I'm apt to do when I'm having a good time. Last question. Yeah. This is a this is an interesting chat GPT add-on. How do you keep your employees engaged and excited about their work? And then do you throw dance parties in the break room or do you just let them wear Hawaiian shirts on Fridays? Oh, I, I throw dance as anyone who knows me knows that I throw dance parties in the break room. Well, I'm confused what era, Chad, when was the break? I feel like break room stopped being. A yeah, I don't think that's actually a thing in corporate America. Sounds very office space-like. 
Yeah. I mean, I run, how do I keep employees engaged at work? I mean, I think there's a, there's a few things that I do. One, as a team building games company, and we, my team, which is the company, has a, has a standing lunch every Wednesday, which I know people are more precious about their lunch than others, but, uh, but it's every Wednesday that we gather together and play games with each other. So either we'll bring in another team building company or play or ticket to ride or categories online. And that's an awesome way for us to just all connect as a fully remote company with moments of levity. And I would say for that, right, that is if I'm busy in theory, the easiest thing that I could miss as a manager, right? I don't have to be there. Work isn't dependent on it. And yeah, that is a sacred block on my calendar that I do not miss for anything because I think it's really important as the leader of the team. One, I just enjoy being there with the team. And two, for people to know that it is as important to me as it is to them. And then I think there are smaller things I do around check-ins. I do smaller lunches with people on my team. But the biggest thing for me is having this standing thing where we all get together that people enjoy and that I'm present for. And the last thing I would say is we also do check-ins to make sure people still want to keep it on the calendar because I think some teams love this. Some teams, when there's mandatory work happy hours, want to be home with their family or don't want to spend extra time all the time trying to cultivate this family at work. And that's okay too. I think it's just knowing who are your employees, what are they looking for, and then cultivating events or non-events that feed that. I think the the big thread through all of this and the reason that your team lunches work, but also the, the same reason that they don't work for everyone is that really the the best way to keep people motivated is to recognize that they are also human beings with personal lives, right? Human beings cannot simply produce widgets of work and go to sleep, right? They have other commitments, other parts of their lives. They also have a need for connection, right? If anything, the pandemic taught us that we all have a need for connection. I think when you talk about something like a team lunch, it sounds, I'm sure there are lots of large corporations who are like, oh, team brown bag lunch with the VP every Friday, right? That's a little meh for me. But I think a, a well-intended team lunch, of, we're not going to talk about work. This is just us as human beings getting together and making people feel like they're a part of something is a really good idea. And the reason it doesn't work for everyone is because some people, they, who they are as human beings, doesn't have time for that. To summarize the big thread there is, how do you help people feel like they are human beings at work and they are a part of something bigger than just we're all just sitting next to each other and delivering widgets? Totally. And I think there is also something, not, there's many ways to do this, meaningful conversation, being considerate of people's lives outside of work, team building events, but just quickly in the team building space, which I know kind of intimately, there is such an energy difference on a 12 o'clock game where people are just told, take an hour off work, at, at at noon for us to just enjoy ourselves and you don't need to add that hour back and work till seven or eight now just let's just take an hour out of the day and invest in having fun as a team versus when we host events at eight or nine p.m when people just want to sign offline and it's now join this trivia game while blue bloods is playing in the background that the, the energy level is so different where it, with the energy on the former games being so much higher than that on the latter it's a really good insight yeah, there's a little tactical uh, tactical piece of data from the Barn Games team to use. Yeah, I just think it goes back to people people want connection, but they don't want to be forced to continue working or associating with coworkers beyond when they want to. Right. That makes total sense. I'm curious because I think I have a hard time defining this, but you who are literally in this space might be better at it. Do you agree that there is a difference between what I described as the VP brown bag lunch in big corporation and something that has a true meaning and positive impact in a company doing something like a barn on games game and what what is the difference because i think it's really easy for leaders to fall into the rabbit hole oh, i'm just going to schedule these things yeah virtual happy hour or whatever don't really hit the nail on the head at all in terms of creating engagement yeah generally i think there is this was such an unplanned digression in the barn on game but but <laughs> on, on the topic of how do you fuel engagement among performers I do think there's generally a difference. The biggest difference with a, a team of bar on games type event is the connection facilitated. So all of the action is occurring in breakout rooms. And I think Max, you've played one of these before where you're actually many, many times. Yeah. Talking, deliberating, debating with team members rather than just staring at one presenter. I think any activity where you're at bar on we consciously chose to not spend money on the technology and wishing people all around an app, but rather creating a product 
that was solving for the number one need that emerged in 2020 was, which was this desire for connection for people to be seen as people and not just automatons carrying out work in this pandemic environment. I do think, however, not to poo poo the VP brown bag lunches. I think it's very dependent. On I'm literally you. thinking of one that I really disliked. Apologies to this. And people. that was, you a, know who you are from many years, years ago in my career. That was a terrible one, but I do think there is there is a hunger in this remote environment and just for younger employees to learn. We have lunch and learns at Bar None where anyone at the company will present on an interesting part of the business they've been working on. I think if a VP is going to come in and really share information about their career, how they got to where they got, interesting things they're working on at the company, that can be really valuable when it's just checking a box to have something on the schedule and there's no intentionality. I think you're better off not doing that. That that is fair. I think yeah, it seems to be all about intention and maybe a little bit less about the what specifically is offered. Though I do think your call out of Barnon Games doing breakout rooms, that's where connection occurs. In my experience, having done a Barnon game probably five or six times, the opportunity to meet people who I don't otherwise interact with and make connections with the company, that in those breakout rooms, that's where that happened. Yeah. Right. Intentionally or not, that setup worked well for that. And those connections continued well after that event took place exactly again in the spirit i feel more happy and enjoy my work more and so much of this talk about how do you make good performers great performers that feeds into this thread of taking time to do the thing that feels like a nice to have and not a need to have but recognizing that by doing that, the spillover effects are going to be huge. And while they might feel indirect, the sum of their effect is often greater than something else you couldn't spend that hour on. Yep, I, that's absolutely right. I think the the practice of good management enabling your people is probably maybe more broadly exactly what you said. It's not doing one big thing. It's doing a bunch of smaller things consistently over time. If you just have one development performance improvement conversation and you never revisit it again, who knows what's going to happen? But if you have that conversation repeatedly over time, you're a lot more likely to get success. And I think same with creating a a collaborative environment where people are happy. You could have one happy hour ever and what will that do? Or you could create opportunities for connection on a consistent basis and have people feel like they're a part of something. 100%. Well, that was like a good way to end it with a, a unintended plug for Bar None Games. Yeah, we're here for all your team building needs. Well, thank you for joining, as always. Thank you for having me. I've already <laughs> planned my next visit. You're really almost elevated to co-host now. Don't give me any idea. I know, I have some ideas now. Don't threaten before. me with a good time, as, as yeah. we say. That can be the title of this episode. <laughs> so, no, I guess these have more practical titles, right? So I actually started with one title. This is what often happens when I'm writing blog posts or write, or doing episodes is I write a I write a topic and then I'll start actually writing or start actually talking about that topic or drawing up the content for it. And I'll realize I need to change the, the title to better Ooh. match what I ended up talking about. So this was originally going to be titled How to Make an Employee a Top Performer. I I think this is probably something more like how to help your employees succeed Ooh. okay we love i i I don't know that's a that's a hot take may it may even change maybe chat gpt will come up with something about miniature horses to to just don't use whatever the phrase was i said in the middle where i couldn't think of words when i was like (laughs) feel what i say (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for the subscribe. Ian Bay. Will do. I will I will cut out that part specifically. Please don't use that in the title. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. I, I hope you have a lovely weekend. You as well. Enjoy. I'll thank see you, you next week.